less. He definitely is sweet. Yeah. He is less, very less. So that might be the reason. Three to seven. All right. You all hear us all right in the room? We can hear you now. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Good morning, still. Um, uh, today we have the PNNL E6 seminar. Um, the, sorry, AGI E6 seminar for the Advanced Grid Institute. And we're excited today to have a talk on resilient communities via risk driven infrastructure planning and automated restoration with our two speakers. And I'm going to introduce both speakers and then turn it over to them. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Anamika Dubey, is a Huey Rogers Endowed Chair, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering in the School of EECS here at WSU Pullman. She has, also has a joint appointment as a research scientist at PNNL as part of our Advanced Grid Institute. Her research is focused on model-based and data-driven methods for decision support in large-scale electric power distribution systems, for, for improved efficiency, operational flexibility, and resilience. She's recipient of the NSF Career Award and is currently leading several high-impact projects for DOE, National Science Foundation, and the power industry. <coughs> Dr. Wei Du is a staff research engineer at Pacific Northwest National Lab. His main areas of research are control design, modeling and simulation of power systems with a high penetration of power electronic devices. He currently serves as the PI for multiple Department of Energy projects, focusing on the impacts of high impedance, uh, the impacts of high penetration of inverter-based resources on the transient and uh, dynamic behaviors of power systems at different scales. He's also the technical lead of the modeling simulation area of the universal interoperability for grid-forming inverters uh, consortium co-funded by the DOE by DOE Solar and Wind offices. He serves as associate editor for the IEEE transactions on Smart Grid. So, Dr. Dubé and Dr. Du. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll get started on our uh, presentation today, and then I'll invite uh, Dr. Du to continue in between. Um, Okay, so, so the topic of today's presentation is Resilient Communities via Risk Driven Infrastructure Planning and Automated Restoration. This is a project that uh, recently got uh, funded, uh, awarded by uh, DOE, uh, Department of Energy Solar Technology Office. And our goal is to look into how we can uh, enhance the resiliency of the communities using um, uh, uh, automated planning and restoration. I don't know why it's working on its own. <laughs> that is not a good news, but... I'll try to catch up with the speed or maybe go back and forth. So um, the, 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 this is the uh, you know, kind of motivation for the work. We are seeing uh, electric power grids, which are changing in nature and requirement. Specifically, the focus is here to look into dramatic increase, increase in extreme weather events related outages. So for example, in US from 2010 to 2019 and the previous decade, we observed 70% more outages. And weather-related outages cost extensively, um, uh, extensive amount of money uh, to utility companies as well as to system operations. Uh, in fact, uh, utility customers experienced 1.33 billion outage hours in 2022, which is 73 percent up from what was observed in 2019. So basically, the the point is that the um, extent of the outages as well as the cost of them is increasing significantly as we are looking to changing weather condition. Let me <laughs> fix this first. I cannot talk like that. This is, I think it is probably these things. We need to turn off. Hopefully that will work. Um, online, can you still see my screen? Yeah, we can still see it, Anamika. 
Okay, awesome. All right, so that's the context. And then uh, coming to the communities or distribution level, which is the focus of this project, it's not these you know challenges or these problems are not contained primarily at transmission grid, but more at the distribution level. In fact, most of the outages are, are there and it takes longer time to restore is because of the damages in the distribution network. And uh, uh, one of uh, these could be damages, for example, your transformers, utility poles or overhead distribution lines are vulnerable to these severe weather events, particularly high wind, and they might be damaged. And then you need to, of course, that can cause a lot, a lot, a lot of outages. But at the same time, there are also these questions around public safety power shutoffs, where to avoid the uh, impacts of these extreme weather events, you might shut off the power supply for these customers so that it doesn't cause even more outages. Specifically, the case in case of a wildfire kind of situation, right? In all of those cases, uh, your distribution customers are going to get affected, and they're going to observe prolonged outages. So the question that we were asking, and these are just some examples of what happened in past year on why when, when customer power was interrupted because of several extreme weather kind of situations uh, that not necessarily cause damage to the distribution system, but just because they are there, you need to manage them in a particular manner that required cut cutting off power to the customer. Itself. So now that is a problem. That's the problem that we started to look into, or it's the focus of this particular project, where the goal is to figure out how we can um, still supply our customers during these extreme weather events or what could be done to essentially secure the power supply during extreme weather event, which we're calling here in terms of resiliency for uh, for these communities specifically uh, to address these extreme weather event related outages. So the point is that um, our infrastructure is of course aging and it is stressed because of different reasons. And we are seeing a lot of extreme weather related outages at the distribution network and that basically motivates the incorporation of resiliency in distribution system operation. Let's see the same pattern. How can we do that? Uh, there are different ways of really managing this problem, right? I mean, one of the ways could be that you really make a very resilient and very uh, tough to break grid, right? But other could other way could be that we actually use automated solutions to basically provide, provide some solution to these kind of challenges. Now, one thing I want to specify or, or, or highlight is that these distribution level problems cannot be solved through transmission level solutions. You really have to embed these solutions at the distribution level because this is about you know, damages at the distribution system itself. So the question we start to ask is that how can grid edge provide resiliency services and what are the things that are required to enable those kind of you know, um, resiliency services from this grid edge? And there were different concepts that are floating around uh, and, and you know, being worked on through different projects, through different deployment as well. And these are just some list of those particular uh, solutions that can help us keep Keep the lights on when you are going to observe this kind of different extreme weather event and of course these solutions work differently and and they are they are useful in different um, uh, to different levels for different types of you know um, extreme weather events that you see so for example one uh, one approach could be that we not we use non traditional ways of operating the grid so instead of using you know traditional up uh, top down flow of the power or restoration of the network, we start to think about, can we use network microgrids to support some of these critical infrastructure when there is going to be an extreme weather event for which you have are either observing the outages in the system or you are shutting off the power supply to your customers. So that's one of the non-traditional ways of operating the system. Other could be that you use the demand site flexibility to manage rare contingency. This is something that you might have seen in terms of flex alerts that are issued in, let's say, California, when you are going to see a heat stroke coming up where delivery infrastructure or power delivery system or the distribution level gets congested and constrained. So the question is that can we actually call upon these flexible resources to provide services during the, those kind of contingency conditions so that we don't have to uh, curtail power to our customers, right? Because we still need to manage the distribution level um, asset constraints. Other could be that we actually use these distributed resources to provide bulk grid support. And this is something that is um, to mitigate the challenges that are emerging from the bulk grid side of the problem, not at the distribution level, right? So, so they can be used as distributed resources uh, to provide different kinds of grid, uh, grid support, including you know, bulk grid support for frequency and voltage regulation, or even black start capability to some extent. Of course, all these solutions, if you really want to enact it, um, it requires a larger and greater penetration of renewables or controllable assets at the distribution level. But the question is still here we ask is that if that can be done, how can we enable that technology to provide the kind of services that we want, both at the distribution as well as at the bulk grid level? Okay. So, um, so that's just you know an example of how this can be done, and this is one thing that we are focusing on this particular you know project where we're looking into how network microgrids can be used for restoration. But we are not just you know uh, stopping there; it's it's an end-to-end -end solution to think about how we can provide 
uh, grid resiliency for underserved communities, which are primarily affected in this case, high speed wind hazards, which are essentially causing damage to the pole infrastructure or electric distribution system infrastructure using some sort of, you know, um, by, by using these automated solar plus storage solution for restoration, which is basically creating these dynamic island. But at the same time, planning your system in a way that they can provide this kind of services. So, you know, these are the, that's the two end of the problem that we want to solve. One is what resources do we need to have, uh, do, should be available at the distribution grid level to provide certain level of resiliency? And then how can you use those resources using some sort of, um, you know, um, automated solutions or, or algorithms to basically make sure that those services can actually be provided once you have deployed those resources at the distribution level, okay? So the problem is this, um, how do we plan and operate the distribution grid for resiliency? And this resiliency, what is resiliency is to be defined by community, but more importantly, it is about you know, saving some critical infrastructure, critical load, or some sort of asset when there is an extreme weather event against extreme weather events. And this extreme weather event in our case is high speed wind hazard. The reason it is important to specify extreme weather, weather event is that your solutions really are tailored towards what kind of problem you are encountering. If your distribution network is getting damaged, then of course different solution has to be thought about. Then if you are looking into a heat stroke and you are seeing a supply problem instead of a delivery problem, right? So that's why it's important to look into what specific hazard we are talking about. So with that context, the question is what is needed for us to um, you know, plan and operate the distribution grid for resiliency? And uh, we look into um, these two questions that we want to provide you know, this kind of a flexible distribution system that can support your critical infrastructure in case of major, major outages. For example, in this case, your network is getting damaged at different locations. So, but you do have a lot of controllable assets which can hopefully provide some sort of dynamic islanding capability and support your critical infrastructure with the help of the poles and lines which are still standing. Right. So the question is, how do we make a system that is capable of this kind of operation and how do we make it possible for system to operate in this particular manner that require to answer both question. One is the long term planning question, or the planning question for this problem itself. How and where do where you harden the pole, for example, or how and where you place new devices which can provide this kind of operational flexibility for resiliency in your distribution system. So that's a planning problem that needs to be informed by what are the needs of resiliency in your distribution system? What are the metrics you are measuring? What is the cost benefit trade off and what is really feasible in terms of long term ins ensuring long term resiliency for these communities? So that's the problem that needs to be solved. And once we solve this problem, or actually simultaneously as we are solving, solving this problem, we also want to answer this question that once you have all these sorts of automated resources in the network, what can you do to coordinate and control these distributed res resources to restore power or to provide you know, local supply of, of energy or maintain an stable islands in case you are observing extreme weather even. Right? So those are the two questions we want to solve. These are the two major uh, problems or re research problems in this particular project. Project. So the project itself, you know, looks into um, um, the research aspect of this problem. That how do we develop the scalable and resilient solutions for this automated feeder operations, specifically during extreme weather events? So we are looking into once you have an extreme weather event, how we can quickly restore and recover the supply, as well as you know, continue to supply some of our critical assets using automated solution that you have. Um, this problem, solving this problem requires solving those two stages that we talked about, which is resiliency oriented operation solution to support planning. Basically, we want to know how to plan our system so that we can support the kind of operational flexibility that we desire, and then come up with a solution so that these automation flexibility can be enabled. That's the main, um, you know, uh, technology aspect or the research aspect of the uh, leg of the pro project itself. The project also incorporate field demonstration of these particular uh, advances that we are proposing on actual utility distribution system. And our goal is to look into um, how um, how we can demonstrate that the solutions that we are proposing can be used in real world operational setting for utilities to restore their supply using solar and storage with the help of the operational solutions that we are proposing. So that's the field demonstration part of it. And their active uh, component of this project is also on community engagement, where our goal is to engage with local community where we are trying to deploy the solution to understand what their resiliency need is instead of prescribing those resiliency need ahead of time. Through those engagement, develop the metrics that are important for us to plan the system and then validate through simulations as well as through field demonstration that in fact we were able to meet those metrics that we uh, that we have discussed through communities and and what they considered to be of priority for them. Okay. So that's the 
overall uh, description of the project itself. This is what the team qualification is. Um, we have two universities, uh, WSU is the lead. We have West Virginia University supporting us in our different uh, situational awareness and operational decision making tasks. We have uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab who will be extensively providing research and uh, validation support for uh, different kinds of, uh, for evaluation of these new algorithms that we are proposing for a non-traditional ways of operating grid or a landed uh, way of operating the grid. And by grid, I mean distribution system, not the bulk grid. And then we have uh, our industry partner, uh, Com uh, Comet, who, who is what providing us to provide HIL validation and field demonstration tasks. And we'll be basically implementing our solutions with the help of Open Energy Solution and Eaton on, uh, common, on Comet's distribution system to validate our findings and to also demonstrate that the technology actually works. And we have a community engagement with the help of Region 1 Planning Council, who works very closely with Comet on engaging with the community, local community members who are in that particular, uh, who are really affected in those communities to understand what their challenges are and to understand us how to tailor our research along those lines. And lastly, we also have Altitude Grid, uh, who is a grid edge startup. They will be providing support on understanding how do we really control these grid edge resources when we look into a islanded set of op uh, system operation. So that's the introduction of the project, and I'm going to now talk about what were some of the preliminary work we have done, what we are really trying to achieve, and what are the steps for us to get there. So this is the overall description of the technology is a summary that, that we are trying to propose. What you see here is basically a resiliency, some sort of resiliency curve. This resiliency curve is a very notional curve here. This will actually be informed by communication and discussion with community members to figure out what the curve and what the metric should look like. But basically what you see here is, a, um, is, is for an example, you have a traditional system which, has, which is not resilient. It basically, once, once the event hits, its resiliency drops. And then you, you're implementing some solutions that help us its resiliency bring back to the normal. Typically, you don't have a lot of automated solution. You are really re doing the infrastructure restoration till all the infrastructure is restored. After the event has passed through, you get back to the original level of performance. The goal is to get to this you know, green curve where you are seeing that the damage to the distribution system or the damage after, after so and after math of an event does not fall too much, so you can contain it. That's one of the things, and that is a metric that we want to specify. You also do, uh, have some sort of automated solution that you know improves your um, uh, improves basically your um, resiliency during the process. So these are some operational solutions. So that for example, you can do some automated restoration so that not everything collapses. And then after that, you want to make sure that your, your resiliency goes a little bit higher than what it was before. And then still we need to think and figure out what, what does it mean by a little bit higher than that. But the point really I want to make here is that given this is our objective, what we are trying to develop is uh, use different types of already automated systems and softwares that we have to figure out how do we come up with new uh, proactive and corrective measures to make sure that the resiliency is enhanced both in this particular aspect of, of initial damage, as well as in the aspect of the operational resiliency. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the way to reduce this damage, which you are seeing here, is to basically have a system which is more robust to the extreme event that you are seeing. The extreme event that you are seeing here is high speed wind hazards, which basically causes your, causes your poles and your lines to topple, right? The easiest solution to reduce the damage is to underground these lines, right? So that's one of the line hardening solutions that you can see. If we implement those line hardening solutions, we can actually improve this, uh, reduce this initial damage. We can improve this part of the uh, damage or this part of the recovery by basically saying that once the outage has happened, once the damage has happened, we don't have to wait for the full infrastructure recovery to get our power back online. We can actually operate our system in these non-traditional ways in the process so that our resiliency, even in this particular phase when the infrastructure recovery hasn't begun, it still is a little bit better than what it could be. And for that, you can think about these, you know, intentional island formation, their communication, figuring out how we can do bottom-up restoration using these distributed resources to support some of the critical infrastructure. Okay, so these are the two solutions we are looking into, and the, the real question is: these two solutions uh, require, of course, a lot of um, installing new devices and really creating. Um, they, they cost money, basically. So the question really here is: we need to evaluate these solutions from the perspective of what is the cost 
versus resiliency trade off and can we make an informed decision from that perspective so that our planning is informed by what is the value of those planning solution is for the system okay these are three steps of the research team when we start to look into this particular technology so as you know what we really want to do is we want to enhance resiliency at the community level that requires resiliency quantification and planning which means that first we need to quantify what is the existing level of resiliency based on the metrics that we have identified through community stakeholders and then we want to figure out how do we plan our system in a manner that enhances that resiliency in certain certain way right or or what is our goal and we want to basically come up with appropriate allocation of these uh, planning measures so that resiliency gets enhanced and the, then the next question is once the once we have planned our system and, and we have done all the things what can we do with it how do we make sure that once the damage really happens once extreme weather has passed through you have enough situational awareness and automated restoration capability in the system to make some of these solutions provide the service that you want to so that's the second leg of the research where we are looking into how we can use these numerous distributed energy resources and other planning measures that we have provided to provide the good service that we are looking for which is resiliency in this case and finally once you come up with this some of non traditional ways of operation you have now question about you have an islanded network which is a flexible boundary island so you haven't planned for it ahead of time how do we make that island to be stable for operation for long term so that's the third leg of the research where we are looking into what control solutions you need at the local island level to make sure that those islands are stable and can actually provide the service grid service that you want to so it's kind of an end to end solution starting with the community assessing their uh, their needs for resiliency figuring out what plans should be there from there on having the situational awareness for operational flexibility and from there to get an operational scenario where you can really enact some of these solutions and uh, provide the grid services that you want to and we just don't want to develop algorithm for this this these uh, solutions will be extensively validated using different simulations they will also be demonstrated with the help of couple of um, distribution system utility uh, feeders as well as some of the outdoor test pits and our goal is also to do some sort of community demonstration to understand and communicate what the resiliency benefits are of this technology that we are proposing okay all right uh this slide just you know provides a little bit more overview of research team i'm going to skip through it in the interest of time and i'm going to talk about a little bit of prior work that we have done to basically um, that that will inform some of these uh, research that we are proposing so the first question that arises when we talk about you know how do we make our distribution system resilient which are very traditional distribution system is how do we plan for resources which can help us provide those kind of resiliency service to plan for those re resources we need to know what the resiliency is which means that we need to have some sort of quantification for resiliency and this particular work that we did proposed a way to quantify resiliency from risk perspective and we basically said that let's take a risk definition of resiliency and try to figure out what is the risk of outages when we are looking into these extreme weather event and we came up with a simulation framework that can quantify the risk of those outages as we look into uh, for different um, um, simulation you know settings so the way we do it is that we 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 basically say that based on meteorological data that you have available for given community what is the probability of um, um, what is the probability of let's say the event that you are monitoring as an extreme weather event in this case we are saying it's the high speed wind hazard so what kind of wind speed you have been seeing in this particular location and what is the probability density function for it so that gives you a quantification of what is the probability of observing high speed winds which is here then we look into one of the things that you need to really translate the impact of weather to the system is how does those weather event really affect your components um so the online person cannot see the slides that stuck in the slide 3 and outside of the slide show yes that stuck there slide 3 okay sorry about that uh let me share again Can you see it now? No. Um yeah, no. Yes, yes, now it's now it's good. All right. Someone needs to monitor that. So if you, if you can yeah. see the chat that would be great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we go from weather event to uh, to component it's something that we need to translate to understand what is the impact of the weather event that you are trying to model at the system level. This can be done 
at the holistic system level. But what I'm saying is that, or what I'm claiming is that it's better to be done at the component level because you really, really need to be able to translate these simulation capabilities to the system level. What, what, what is needed is to embed this information, which we don't have right now, on what kind of extreme weather event characteristic really affects the component performance. That's the whole point. So in this case, we actually develop a very simple approach where we said that only wind speed defines whether the component will be damaged or not damaged. This is a simpler, you know, an example definition of how component level fragility or outage really gets mapped to the weather event you're observing. This is not comprehensive. Your component level fragility is a function of not just your you know, extreme weather event speed or wind speed. It could be a function of the direction of the wind. It could be a function of how much rain you have observed. It could be a function of the soil, you know, permeability where your pole is standing. There are a bunch of other criteria that is needed to really map this. And that mapping needs to be done for, for several you know, distribution or even transmission grid uh, components that you see to connect the impact of weather event at the grid level. Okay, So that's one of the research pieces that, that, that we will be working on in this project as well to expand this particular understanding beyond what we have right now, which is just a very simple unidimensional component level fragility curve, which just maps the event of wind speed to the uh, failure probability of the component. Okay. Now, once you do that, then to evaluate system level impact, what you really do is you simulate that particular event scenario on, let's say, a distribution simulator and observe what the outage is going to be. You keep on doing it again and again for uh, several, uh, you know, um, wind speed, and you basically observe a loss function that says that what is the probabilistic loss of this component as your as your wind speed is changing. And this loss function basically gives you a map for the entire wind speed that your system was seeing, and based on the weather to grid component model mapping. And what I'm saying is that the highest the, the, the highest impact low probability event in this tail probability of this damage function should specify your resiliency, which basically says that what is the loss of load probability for those highest impact event. That gives you a quantifiable measure that you can actually measure and use that in your planning process. Now, this is what we did before. These metrics that we are measuring could change based on the community feedback on what is important for them, right? But the approach, I think, is still relevant from the perspective that you need to measure the uh, you need to measure the risk from the high impact prob even probability so that you can then design solutions which can help you reduce those risks. So that's the information or, or you know background here. Of course, all the research that we do for this particular project will in involve more comprehensive component level model, more comprehensive system level analysis, and then more comprehensive and possibly multidimensional uh, loss function analysis. So if you, let's say, implement some sort of um, you know, remedial solution that should shift your uh, probability curve a little bit to the left, that's the way we can say that we have quantifiably improved resiliency by this amount. That's the framework that we proposed before, and that's the framework we are going to use with a lot more uh, analysis and a lot more um, um, modeling capabilities which are not captured here. <clears throat> the second problem is then once you know what your resiliency is, how do you plan for it? And this is some background on planning work. And again, we said that you know you can do planning in different manner, but there has to be a quantifiable way to, for you to say that this much. This is how much your resiliency has increased for this much. This much of money that you are going to spend, and that requires a framework. And we said that you can use a risk averse uh, planning framework for this particular problem where the question could be um, where to place DGs, which lines to harden, where to place these switches. All those are you know, the planning question that you have for this distribution system. And you're trying to answer this question from the perspective that what is the cost of really implementing these solutions? And what is the resiliency benefit you get from it, which is measured in terms of the risk that we just saw before? which changes because now you have a different system, right? So that gives, that gives you basically an algorithmic framework to, do, to measure these risk cost, cost trade-offs and evaluate what the benefits are for the money that you're spending. There are different challenges, which are the challenges we are going to tackle in this particular project. One of the challenges is that when you look into this risk averse optimization, these are extremely large scale problem. And what are their outcomes will uh, depend a lot on what kind of scenarios you end up simulating. So there are a lot more challenges in really solving this problem when you look at high impact, low probability events, which are uh, basically tail probabilities of the, of the problem. So it's stochastic optimization we start to become very challenging. However, we did solve a simpler version of this problem before. That's our preliminary work. We looked into a distribution system and we proposed basically how can we use a risk-based framework to figure out where do we want to place some of these resources so that resiliency enhances. 
And the overall structure of the problem looks something like this. It's a two-stage problem where what you do in stage one is you define the location and sizes of your planning solutions, which could be your DG switches, line hardening. Those are your decisions that you want to optimize for. And you want to optimize them in a manner that your stage two problem, which is after default has happened, gives you the best solution or gives you the, the optimal solution for the um, operational, once you implement those operational decisions. So the fundamental point is this, you plan for this stage one, but you do embed what the operational solution will look like once the fault happens in your optimization problem. So you are being, that's how you really measure the risk after the outages happened and after you have implemented some of those planning solution and how you can improve it or enhance it using these metrics. So it really becomes a problem of two stage decision making where first stage is the planning decisions, which is dependent on what you are deploying, what is the cost of those deployment. And the second stage is once those resources are deployed, how your operations will improve, which is basically how much more load you will be able to restore. Make sense? So we did the help of you know 123 bus system, we did try to figure out which lines to harden, which DGs to place, and this slide is kind of highlighting what happens when you use a risk neutral versus risk ever solution. And risk neutral is basically saying that all the risk, all the outages are equally valuable for me, and I want to improve our solutions for all of them. And risk neutral is saying risk ever is saying that these high impact, low probability events are the more more of a concern for us, and we really want to improve our performance there. Okay, and the solution differences I can just highlight briefly is when you start to uh, play with risk averse, we started to see that DG placement and the line hardening solution is start to get much and much more focused around some of the critical loads that you have assigned. These blue lines are the basically critical load zones that we have, which basically said that uh, the main main solution was main um, understanding from this simulation was that risk averse case said that deploy several smaller DERs at localized locations so that you can actually support these local resources, right? And it actually gave you some sort of optimality from the perspective of what risk measure you are trying to optimize for and how much you're improving it. And that risk measure goes back to that CVAR probability that we showed it before. So this is another solution where we are showing you risk ever versus risk neutral case. These you know, equations are all useless. What you see is here. So you have risk neutral policy and risk evers. Risk neutral says that implement deploy just one DG of this much kilowatt. Uh, what we are doing here is we are setting a budget of 1 million and we are saying that uh, what is the solution for these uh, planning measures when you are trying to use a risk neutral versus risk averse policy. So the risk neutral says that just have one DG and have three lines to harden and some uh, have some three tie switches. And you know that in regular restoration process, when you're major outage has not happened. You really close, open and close the tie switches and sexualizing switches to restore the load, right? So when you go for risk neutral case, it is really trying to optimize the possible paths for reconfiguration in your system. When you go for risk averse case, it's trying to optimize more for the DG intentional islands that you can create in your system. So it's kind of reflecting those extreme cases when you start to solve this problem. So some of these trade-offs can be evaluated and that's the value of this algorithmic framework, which is what we'll be using to demonstrate or come up with solutions for this particular problem. This further shows you what starts to happen in terms of critical load that is being picked up when you use a risk ever versus risk neutral policy. And you can see that you know higher critical load is picked up for risk evers because you're really planning for those risk evers cases. Make sense? All right. I I have a lot of time. So I'm quickly going to talk about resilient operation and what background work we have done there. So, you know, once you plan, you really have to figure out how to operate, right? So this slide is just talking about what we have done were um, past work on how can you use all sort of resources that you have in your system, including switches and DGs to restore the system. And we have worked on different types of algorithm to be able to restore this uh, power network, supply most of the critical load using different grid following, grid forming assets, as well as different types of switches. It's just one example that shows you that as you have more number of types switches, you will be able to restore the system better. And this also shows you that if you have more number of DGs, you can use them more effectively to restore more critical load. This kind of you know, information feedback to the planning problem that we solved before, which also reflects the same kind of set. Right? Um, one thing that we looked into and that will be used in this particular, uh, particular project is that op centralized operation becomes a lot more uh, a, a lot less appealing when you're dealing with extreme weather cases, right? So if you are gathering all the information centrally and coming up with the restoration solution centrally, it is not that appealing because it is prone to single point failure. So we looked into different kinds of layered architectures 
on how these operational solution can be made in a sense that you can coordinate the distributed resources throughout the distribution system and come up with a solution that 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 can still work and it's not prone to single point failure there's some preliminary work that we did where we distributed our decomposed our distribution system into multiple areas and we look into how these areas can really coordinate in a distributed manner so that we can implement a restoration solution even when most of your uh, if even when some of these agents might not be working or might be outage and that is a layered architecture or distribution decision making uh, framework that is what we are going to further develop and deploy in this particular project in combat system okay. all right and uh, my, i wanted to highlight that much of the leg work for this particular project was done in previously funded you know um, pnl uh, project in collaboration with pacific northwest national lab this include our collaboration on grid apps t project which is about developing these application for open source distribution management systems and also citadel's project we have where we have looked into how network microgrids can coordinate in a distributed setting for resilient operations and uh, this slide is basically showing some some of the architecture that will go into uh, this resilient restoration uh, solutions which is more distributed and decentralized for uh, restoration applications i'm going to skip through this this is just our uh, implementation on a grid apps platform and we are working on distributed version of this problem and uh, i'm going to skip through all of these because we don't have time and i'm going to invite uh, my co-presenter uh dr vaidu for his presentation yeah okay hi can you see me and hear me we can see you but let me find if we can we can, we can hear you but let let's see if we can see you how do i that well that, that's fine yeah i can just present <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. sure. So let me let me quickly share this once again, and then we can go from there. All right, so we can still not see you, Bay, but please go ahead. With oh, the that's video. fine. Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay. can you go back to slide twenty-five? Yes. Oh, we can see you. Oh, okay. Can you go back to go back to slides twenty previous slides? I'd like to start from there. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. All right. Yes. Okay, so I will start. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Namika, for this invitation, and also I'm, I'm very glad to be here and also be part of this uh, Anamix, Anamika's project and support the team on this uh, interesting research. So from my presentation, I will talk a little bit more about the, the trends and the dynamics of distribution systems. So I think uh, traditionally distribution system uh, do not have many dynamics issues, but we have more and more inverters there. We believe the dynamics are important for distribution systems, especially in the future. If you are feeder, let's consider 8,500 node test feeder. If you have 500 inverters there, I think the dynamics will be critical. And when you are doing the restoration, I think we will use the optimization to give a restoration plan. We, we like to use a dynamic simulation to, uh, to, to examine if that is feasible or not. But I think the key thing is that now we do not have very good uh, simulation platform to study the large scale distribution system dynamics with high penetration of inverters. So here I like to talk about one CITO project that now I'm collabor uh, I'm running now and how the projects, the CITO projects the results can be used to support the, the project now, the recuperate project that uh, Anamika is leading. So could you please go to the next slide? So uh, this project, uh, this slide just introduced uh, another C2 lab core project, lab core projects that I'm running. It's called Integrated Multi Fidelity Model and a Co Simulation Platform for Distribution System Trends and Dynamic Analysis. It's called uh, Distributedine. So the project team includes a PNL, Oak Ridge, a GE Research, uh, Comet, and the Purdue University. So basically, basically for this project, we just want to study the trends and dynamics of distribution systems. So there are three topic areas. So the first one is uh, the mod is modeling of uh, inverter based dis uh, inverter based resources for distribution system. So we will utilize different modeling approaches, including white box, black box, and gray box modeling to address the challenges for inverter modeling. <clears throat> 
at the distribution level. And the second topic is about uh, uh, co-simulation platform developments. So we will leverage PNL's open source tools, including GreenLab, the Helix, a grid pack for various types of co-simulation. And the third topic is that we have the real uh, the comet as our partner, so they will pro provide the real world micro PMU and the point on wave data for us from the real feeders to capture these events and for us to calibrate and uh, validate those models. So next slide, please. So this slide basically talk about the first topic is about modeling. So it's about, we call it the physics space and the data driven modeling for inverters and the loads at the distribution level. So I think we have different approaches called the white box modeling, black box modeling, and the gray box modeling. They are used under different conditions to address different challenges of inverter modeling. Uh, the, the white box modeling is a more like a traditional approach. So here we will develop the uh, generic and the high resolution uh, EM electromagnetic transient and the per phase phaser models for utility scale inverters for distribution system studies. Uh, this including the you know grid forming and the grid following inverters and also the inverter in internal building protection that's also very important to study the transients. So basically for this one we will focus on the both EMT and its per phase phaser modeling for unbalanced distribution system studies. And uh, the, the, the focus here is uh, on large signal transient uh, behaviors. And for the black box modeling is addressing, try to ad address another more important challenging for the IBR modeling because most of the time we do not have the model. If we have the model, we can we can develop those control blocks and use the white box modeling approach. But most of the time, we do not have a have a model. So here, we like to use a data driven approach. We call it black box modeling. Basically, it's a machine learning based approach to to model the IBRs based on the data, uh, the mirror data. And another one is called gray box modeling. Uh, we this is how to uh, aggregate the sources after the service transformer at the distribution uh, at the, uh, after a uh, after a service transformer in a distribution feeder. Even when modeling the distribution system, we are not going to model the all the uh, voltage level down to the secondary uh, level. So here we like to to use some gray box aggregation approach to model. Uh, the response of behind the meter inverters and the load and the motor loads and other loads behind the service transformer, like like the 50 kVN uh, kVA service transformer. So this talk about the model, talk us about the modeling. So next slide, please. And this slide talk about the the co simulation platform that we we are developing on this project. So the first approach is called the EMT and the three phase phaser co simulation. So here we like to expand uh, expand the PNL uh, the the co simulation engine uh, to called Helix to interconnect PSGAD and the GreenLab D to realize a large scale EMT and a three phase phaser co simulation for distribution system. Because we think even today with today's computation technology, it's still very difficult to study the full EMT simulation of 8500 node test feeder with 500 inverters. That's still not uh, quite feasible here. So here we like to use this co simulation, co -simulation approach to uh, interconnect the inverter model may be provided by a, a inverter manufacturer like GE. They will provide us their black box PSG inverter models. And we can connect inverter models to a three phase uh, phaser solver called GreenLabD and run this uh, three phase phaser and the EMT co simulation to study the transient dynamic behavior of the distribution system populated, populated with many inverters. And the, the second is called a large scale transmission and distribution system co simulation. Uh, so here we, we like to uh, use our open source tool called Grid, grid Pack and the GreenLabD. We connect them together to, to uh, study the transients of extremely large scale. PND system, and also we will leverage some uh, parallel computing or supercomputers to uh, speed up this simulation. And uh, this for this top project, because it's mainly at the distribution level, so I will focus on talk a little bit of re uh, progress we have made for the PSG and the GreenLabD co simulation. So next slide, please. So here, uh, because when people can, we can use different uh, approaches to study the transient of distribution system. I think uh, EMT and the phaser co-simulation is definitely a very promising approach. But we like to know how accurate can this uh, full uh, that's co-simulation be again? How it compared to the uh, full EMT simulation? So here we did a very simple. 
uh, model benchmarking work. So here we select this IE34 node test feeder, unbalanced distributed feeder as an example, and we added five uh, grid forming inverter uh, grid forming inverters in this feeder as shown here. And we we use two different approaches to study this feeder. The first is that we model everything, all the feeder and all the inverters in the PSGAT. So it's a full PSGAT and full EMT simulation. And the second approach is we model the feeder in GridLabD. So it's a three-phase phaser network solver. And then we connect five uh, PSGAT inverters uh, to the GridLabD so we can run the parallel computing. And these inverters are very detailed switching level, IGBT level uh, inverters. And then we want to compare the co-simulation res results with the full simulation results, full EMT simulation results, so we can know how accurate can this approach be and uh, can, how it can be used for uh, the large scale transient study of distribution systems. So next slide, please. So, uh, so this project is still ongoing, but we have made some progress. So this uh, this slide just shows some uh, our some our, some of our initial uh, results of this comparison between the uh, full EMT simulation and the three phase phaser PSGAT co simulation, and uh, we can actually set up different faults in the system, line to line for a line to line fault, single line to ground fault, three phase fault. So for this simulation, you can see it's a it's a single line to ground fault, and and then the the blue line is the uh, co-simulation results and the uh, oh, sorry the blue line is the full EMT full PSGAT simulation results and the dash line the red dash line is the uh, co-simulation results and we we put the three phase voltage and the three phase currents waveforms here you can see the comparison results so at the left side is that you can see the voltage waveform it's a single line to ground fault and then we see the voltage on phase A drops a lot but remember this is the distribution feeder the coupling between phases is very strong so you can see on the other phase the voltage increase a little bit because this is unbalanced distribution system distribution system and the coupling between them is strong. And the right side is the response of the grid forming inverter. You can see uh, after a single line to ground fault, the inverter is grid forming inverter res response to this fault by quickly injecting their currents because they are voltage sources. And then, and also we can see its, it's response is not only at phase A because uh, this is coupling the inverter response to occurrence to all the three phases. But anyway, you can see by comparing the full simulation result results and the, the co-simulation uh, co results, we can see the results is pretty accurate. Uh, so there's still room for improvement, especially post the fault. We can see the, the first cycle of the fault is a little bit discrepancy there, but they can be further improved. But anyway, we think this results shows that very, very show that the co-simulation is a very promising approach to study the distribution system uh, transients. And also, if you look at the simulation uh, computation time, you can see that if you really want to run this full EMT simulation with IGBT models, you, you, your time step has to be five microseconds, and it takes four hours to run this eight second simulation. It's re extremely slow. But if you use our co-simulation approach, uh, uh, because each inverter can be run in the different threads, you can leverage this parallel computing uh, and the co-simulation with different time steps. The simulation time step, uh, simulation time, computational time was reduced to 20 minutes. So it's very promising. And note that this is just a 34 node test feeder. So if you are going to study the 8500 node test feeder, I think it will be extremely challenging for PS gas simulation, but it should be uh, it should be doable for this co-simulation. So this just shows that we did this co-simulation platform that can be used to study the transients of distribution system. So next slide, please. <coughs> OK, so as after talking about our CITO Lab Corp project, so here we like to talk about how we can leverage the project we from that uh, the, the results from that project to support the, the recuperate project that Anamica is leading. So this is our small uh, PNL team to support this project. So with this project, we like to uh, explore two topic. So for topic one is we want to design innovative overcurrent and overload mitigation control strategies for grid forming inverters to energize different Call loads during the restoration process because, for example, uh, nowadays we know you can use grid forming inverters to do the black start uh, of a system, but typically they use a lot of this soft soft start method to energize the load. But I assume that during the restoration process, you have to energize the 
loads sequentially, you have to mod energize different loads. Maybe at the first load, you can use stop start, but when you energize one load, how about how do you energize other loads? It might cause some overcurrent and overload issues. So we want to design some controls for grid forming inverters to address those issues. So that's a topic one. And also topic two is we want to use the, uh, the code simulation, code simulation platform we developed for this project uh, from the previous project to support the, to examine the feasibility of the restoration plan. So for example, uh, uh, Anamika gave me a, a restoration plan based on her optimization uh, algorithm, and we want to use to see if that is more uh, is realistic, uh, if that restoration plan is real, realistic or not by considering the system dynamics. So we can use this platform to examine those critical transients. For example, if you have if you want to have multiple islands, how you co uh, connect them together and how you energize different loads. I think these issues can be studied using this co simulation platform and also this study will also based on the comment real feeder model because that feeder model is typically very large has hundreds of nodes so i think this co-simulation platform will be a, a good uh, platform to study this kind of transients during the restoration so this is our plan and uh, we are at the beginning of this project and again thank you very much namika we are very excited to work on this project so i will stop here uh go give it back to you all right thank, thank you very and of course thanks for the collaboration uh, so as you can see, the project itself is, uh, has several components that will have to fit together to provide community resiliency, and it, uh, you know, ensuring that those non-traditional ways of operation really work, both from the control setting, control points, which Dr. Mani is providing us uh, his expertise in how do we design control algorithms, and from the fault and dynamics and protection with, with uh, Dr. Do is providing us the, his expertise on how do we evaluate those transient and how do we make it happen. It's the third leg of the research that that will require a lot more effort from us to look into how we can really make these solutions work for an unbalanced system where we are forming these islands in a very dynamic way. So I'm going to you know, skip through a bunch of these slides which are talking about how are we going to integrate the solution, how are we going to demonstrate it, and all those things in the interest of time. And just going to jump on the last slide on uh, some list of application and uh, you know, um, recognizing the support from DOE C2 Racer funding and our collaborators in this project and open it up for question Q&A session. No questions, okay. I'll start with one. Uh, way you talked about the co-simulation uh, platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have been Hi, hearing Andy. from. Uh, hello, uh, this is Mani here. <laughs> we have been hearing from uh, several vendors, uh, you know, ETAP, OpenRT, and even uh, PowerTech Labs. They all talk about co-simulation platforms. And so, what is uh, maybe you can talk about it in general and how the PNNL framework is uh, different. Yeah, that's a good point. So when we, I wrote that proposal, I noticed that issue. So today there are some commercial co-simulation tools like electronics. Uh, you can connect PSCAD and the uh, uh, sorry PSCAD and PSSE for those EMT and the positive sequence phaser co-simulation. But I don't think that work very well for distribution system. So for our project, uh, you know the distribution phase, distribution solver is a three-phase solver. You have to work out for this uh, unbalanced distribution system. So we connect the PSCAD model with a three-phase phaser solver. So it works well for distribution system. So you can easily, easily study unbalanced fault and the line-to-line -line fault. And also you can use grid level model to model the unbalanced dis distribution system very well. But you cannot use uh, electronics like PSSE and PSCAD to do this kind of simulation because that is for block power system, model for transmission transmission system. And uh, uh, I don't know, so I, I, I'm also working with OPRT and uh, uh, those, those software vendors, but I don't think they specifically work on this three-phase phaser and PSCAD co-simulation. But when they talk about co-simulation, <laughs> they're about positive sequence phaser and the PSCAD co-simulation. So that's a difference. I think so, here we did something novel here, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, yeah there's a thank question you. on the chat. Um, so actually two questions. So uh, from Lynn Lee, Question on slide 27, the gray box model you mentioned behind the meter DERs is behind the meter DERs data assumed not clear. What okay, data, so yeah. 
Okay, thank, thank you very much for this question. So uh, I guess it's uh, time is short. I cannot talk all the details. So here for this black box modeling, uh, it's it's a ag ag aggregation, but it's not at the feeder head. It's at the service transformer. For example, in your houses, you have a service transformer that is 50 kVA, right? You have you have several houses connect to that service transformer, and you will have some single phase and uh, uh, single phase residential inverters and maybe different uh, house loads. And the, how we model that behavior after the service transformer, that is something we want to use. We use grid box modeling. Uh, to do that, so I think uh, I think basic uh, that is uh, yeah I, I don't know if that addressed your question or not, but this is at the very beginning and eventually they want this is a task for the Purdue team, so they want to use this kind of physics informed gray, gray box modeling to aggregate them. Uh, I'm not sure if I addressed your question or not. Uh, I don't know, Lindley. Do you want to ask a follow up? Okay, so looks like she said yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, and yeah, it looks like there's another question on the uh, TND interface. Oh, yes, it's for the TND co simulation. It's uh, uh, both uh, the grid, grid pack is for transmission system, it's a positive sequence phase assimilation, and the distribution system is a three phase phase assimilation. So here we still use a, a kind of simple uh, approach to interface them. So and at the Transmission level, we use a current source, controllable current source to represent the distribution system. So the distribution system will send the, uh, will calculate the P and the Q and also use the voltage to get the current and send the current back to grid pack. Uh, so, and also at the distribution level, uh, the trans, uh, transmission is represented as a, sub, uh, a voltage source, controllable voltage source, and the magnitude and the angle is obtained from grid pack uh, to, to connect to send the voltage to grid, grid lab D so they can do the TND co-simulation. Yeah, so in the interface, basically at the transmission level, the distribution is considered as, considered as a current controllable current source. And uh, at the distribution level, the, vo the transmission is considered as a controllable voltage source. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you were uh, for that resiliency planning. You were using the load criticality factor, like which loads are critical. So whenever there will be any fault or any condition is happening, that this critical load will be served always. But Not always. I mean, you can never guarantee it. If it, it's it's a risk based framework that says that with this much probability you can serve it. It's quite possible that when you observe those events, you cannot serve anything because really that particular line got damaged, which you have planned for. So and what about, no, no, what about those uh, non-critical loads? Maybe, is yeah, there any fairness so algorithm why, you are using? Right, right. That's why I said that the resiliency definition has to be worked out through community to understand what is more, more important for them during extreme weather event, right? So if the community has some, some, some critical assets that they want to save, right? For example, uh, and they prioritize as a community itself, then we can prioritize them in our planning process. If they say that, no, we don't want to prioritize anyone and everything is critical for us then we work from that definition and that's why these definitions need to be uh, worked out in coordination with with yeah, his question is on fairness or non critical loads yeah right and and the, I, I think that question is not for us to decide as a technology provider that question is for community to decide on what they consider to be fair right think about a community um, a community hall or something where everyone can gather in case of an extreme weather outage if the community prioritizes that we want that kind of community hall service to be available then that is a critical that becomes a critical load in our definition if they do not as a community not prioritizes then it's not so to me it's a more democratic process from community they have to tell us what is critical. We technology providers cannot dictate it. Okay. Fine. But but non-critical assets. I mean, the algorithm doesn't doesn't differentiate. And the, the algorithm basically says that if you have if you have uh, of course available resources, all the non-critical assets will also be restored if you can if you can make it happen. So one of the. Uh... You're, you're doing the distribution planning, resiliency planning, taking into account uh, some automatic controls Solutions. that will occur. Right. Uh, and then that will give you a chance to then decide what kind of automatic controls yes. you need, right? Yes. Uh, do you 
uh, take into account automatic controls usually means that you have some computer and communication. Yes, exactly. So you have to design that as well. Absolutely. Than just the switches. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the point here uh, when we look into the uh, integration aspect. So um, we are saying that it's going to be layered architecture. And we are, that's why we are involving, uh, we have involved with OES for distributed solutions. And for centralized Fraser, we are working with Eden. The point is to really showcase this layered architecture where we will design the individual distributed agents as well as the communication needs that are there and all that will cost us to really you know enable the solutions so we, that is embedded in the process yeah because the issue today is that the dms doesn't have observability of everything yes and uh, so the, 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 that's the power company yes so then the question is who is responsible for the rest of the stuff that's not observable by the grid operator. Right, right. And that's why we have these distributed agents. So we are saying that this will help us scale the situational awareness and the control problem as well by basically uh, doing this switch level kind of uh, visibility or aggregation for control and visibility. And then it will dispatch the required information to Flizzle, whatever is needed for them to make their own decision, which is more central. So that's how that becomes more layered in terms of both situational awareness as well as uh, control. So that, that was the proposal of the technology that how do we make this, uh, to, to your question, how do we make this automated restoration solution work when we don't have a full visibility at the central location? And again, we don't want to rely on central approach of providing the full visibility because it's prone to single point failure and there are a lot more challenges. So the difference between the DMS and the automatic controls is that the, there's, there, there's a, human decision maker at the DMS. And if your automatic control, control, before you can do the automatic control, you have to know that the automatic control will work given that a storm has gone through. Yes, yes. Right? And, and that, that, that hinges on the fact that how can we get the situational awareness for the network? And it's quite possible that human intervention might still be needed to ensure the safety of the system. And that will be, I think, utilities decision to, to ensure that how much they rely on the algorithms on what they're providing versus actually going and seeing what, what the damages are. Well, more than the algorithms, it's also the the communication channels and things like that. So yeah, it, it damaging, also depends yes. on the crew availability who can fix the communications as well as the power poles. Right, right, right. right. And um, those steps of, you know, uh, need to be in integrated in the second stage of the problem where we are saying that what should we do? The third stage of the problem is more about when we do it, whether it's actually working, right? So the second stage of the problem will, will take care of some of those questions around crew dispatch, crew availability, communication availability, and still be able to provide some sort of good enough situational awareness for the system that can be used for operational decision making. But that's the goal. I want a completely different set of problems. Your community-based uh, concerns. Who are you working with? Because depending on who you work with, the, the situation will be completely different. Right. Right? I mean, one could be fire, one could be tornadoes, one could be... Oh, I see. So we, we basically, uh, we are working with this community, which is in city, uh, which is in Rockford. And we are going to um, uh, Rockford in Rockford, Illinois. Illinois, yes. Oh, okay. So it's Comets system. Yeah, Comets system. And uh, we are really providing the solution, uh, both planning as well as the deployment and demonstration solution for that community. And one of the critical uh, problems for this community by talking to Comet was high speed wind hazards. And that's why we are specifically creating solutions yeah, for yeah. Wind, wind solutions. So that's the focus here. All right, I think we're running out of time. So uh, if you have a question, if you could uh, refer it to our speakers. Yep. So let's thank our speakers for their. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this work. To, uh, to Dr. Schultz and to, uh, uh, to, to Jeff. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Present after a couple of years to update on the 